do you have to be a big, strong, burly dude to be able to ride a Harley Davidson? The answer to that question is no. There are other things that you can do to prepare yourself to be able to ride a Harley Davidson that are greater factors to determine whether or not you're going to be successful on a Harley Davidson. I'm going to be going into those on this video right now. Today I'm going to be talking about a myth or kind of a, a concern that people have when they're thinking about buying a Harley Davidson. Your size and strength, although it can play a little bit of a factor, especially in terms of uh, having a little bit more of a margin for error, but really your size is not the number one greatest determiner of whether or not you can ride a Harley Davidson. So we're going to jump into that, kind of debunk that myth, talk to you about what the most important criteria is to be able to ride a Harley Davidson, and then give you guys some examples of how your size can play a factor into maybe what bike you choose, but really what the most important things are that you can do to prepare yourself to ride a bike. What up guys, Dinah D turned bagger mommy from Laid Laws Harley Davidson. I want to talk to you guys a little bit about why your stature should not determine what bike you're going to be riding. So as you guys see, this is my 2022 uh, Police Road King. Uh, I put my fairing on it, I got my Police Tour Pack on it, but this is not the bike that I started on. I am 5'7", 150 pounds. I've ridden this to multiple states, but you have to do a little bit of practice before you feel comfortable riding something like this. This video is kind of going to talk about how I got to this place where I feel comfortable going state to state on this bike. Let me tell you, eight years ago when I started riding, never thought I would ride a bagger. So guys, I wanted to go over some of the things that you should ask yourself or do for yourself if you're considering getting a Harley Davidson. First of all, like I mentioned before, you don't have to be a tall, strong, burly dude to ride one of these things. A lot of people think that that's the most important thing and that's kind of the gate or the gatekeeper between you not riding and riding. But really the biggest thing that I'll say is your skill. Now skill doesn't just come overnight, but if you have the proper skill and technique to ride a motorcycle properly and handle a heavy cruiser, that's by far the greatest determining factor of being able to ride one of these or not. Number two is experience, and those are kind of very closely related two things. So get the proper experience, build up your skill, and with the proper skill and technique, you know, I've seen 110 pound women that are five foot six riding road glides. So there's no excuse for anybody out there that is, is bigger or taller than that. And a lot of times people say, okay, well, how do I get that experience, Matt? If you're starting at square one, then you need to take the basic rider course. You know, a lot of times it's offered through a local community college or through a dealership, through a rider academy. That's the best place to start. Second, get yourself, if you're a brand new, very green rider, get yourself an inexpensive motorcycle and start riding around your neighborhoods or get an inexpensive dirt bike and if you have access to dirt, go start riding around the dirt. That's the best way to learn. That's how I learned as a little kid. My dad took me out to the desert. I learned in the dirt. If you do have experience like riding a sport bike or something like that, you already have a very good foundation for moving into a Harley Davidson. A lot of times people say, wow, I'm not used to these real big heavy bikes. Well, as my coworker Mickey always says, it's not like you're deadlifting an 800 pound touring bike off of the ground to be able to ride a, a motorcycle. With the proper technique, you're pulling it off the kickstand and the weight is on the tires, you know, it's not on your back. And so with the right muscle memory, you really don't have to be that strong to ride a cruiser. Now, the second thing I always hear people say is, okay, well, I can't touch the ground. So now you're gonna need a touch. But a lot of times people think that they need to have both of their feet completely on the ground in order to ride a motorcycle. And that's just not true. There's a lot of people like Danielle, for example, they're on the balls of their feet. As long as you're on the balls of your feet on both sides of the bike, I deem you personally, I deem you safe to ride the motorcycle with the proper skill. Now, obviously that's important. You have to have the proper skill and know-how to 
to confidently ride a cruiser you know, out on the highways and things like that. I'll tell you guys one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make all the time and I, I try to lead them you know, into not making this mistake, but they go against my advice and they make it. A lot of times guys will buy a bagger, you know, maybe they're 5'7", five, 5'8", five, they're right on that line where maybe their feet aren't completely flat on the ground. They'll swap out the shocks and they'll lower the bike an inch. You're really compromising the ride of the motorcycle when you do that. I've seen so many guys just so they can get just a little bit more on the ground with their feet firmly planted, like the full surface area of their feet. They spend a bunch of money, they swap out that rear shock, and they absolutely destroy the ride. They get out there on the highway, they're riding 75 miles an hour down the highway, and they hate the ride because they've compromised it so much by switching out the shock. My advice to that person is get used to the standard height of the shock. Maybe it's in your local neighborhood or whatever. Get to where you're confident to be able to handle the weight, you know what it's going to do, and just keep the shock or even raise it up. Uh, because if you really want to get out there and do some mileage, which is why people buy baggers in the first place, then you're going to want that travel in the rear suspension. One thing you could do if you're considering swapping out the shocks on a touring bike is consider swapping the seat before the shocks. It's one screw, it's easy to do, it's less money, and that can give you as dramatic of effect as the lowered shock will but you're not compromising the ride as much. Yes, you may be taking away some of the cushion to get that seat height a little bit lower, but that's far less severe with far less consequences than changing out the suspension. When you change out the suspension, you're doing a lot of things like you're changing the handling through turns um, and you're really just limiting the bike a lot. And it's something that's a little bit more permanent than a seat is. You know, a seat, again, you can change it with one screw. I change seats on my bike all the time. <coughs> Riding. I was on sport bikes. I know, I know. Started on a Ninja 250. I actually never dropped that bike. Um, I did get into an accident on it, but I never dropped it myself. Uh, then after that, I went to a Ninja 636. That bike, I did drop. Um, on a lot of my bikes, I do uh, have a tippy toe stance. So when I end up on my bikes, I'm like this. So a lot of people are like, well, you're small. How can you ride that bike? It's really all about balance and figuring out how it's going to work for you. So on my Ninja, I had pulled up to the dealership I worked at before, and I pulled into the parking lot, and I was making eye contact with one of my coworkers, and all of a sudden, it just went, uh-oh, what did I do? I kind of laughed, and then I waited, because I decided I wasn't gonna throw my back out by trying to pick it up myself. Anyways, that was the first time that I dropped that bike. After that, um, I was riding a lot of different Harleys at the time. Now, I was working at a Harley-Davidson dealership when I bought that 636, and then I decided, hey, I really need to get on a Harley. And I really fell in love with a Fat Bob with the new Milwaukee 8 in it. And I also really loved the T-Sport design that came out on a lot of the Dynalo Rider S's at the time. So when I rode the two of them, I really decided that that 110 twin cam motor was it for me. And I decided to go with that bike. Started off with stock shocks on it, then I went to RWD 13 inch shocks. And then I really love that nice fender gap in the rear. So I put 14s on it. And same thing as I do on this bike, my dyna is actually a little bit worse because these are 13s, but again, I'm up on my tippy toes like this. And over time, I just learned how to ride like this, adjust my weight kind of like I do on a dirt bike and figure it out. When I first started selling Harleys, I swore I would never ride a bagger. I was intimidated by them, the weight of them, the size of them, the fairing on the front was way different than the sport bikes I had been riding. I didn't mentally understand. When I first decided to ride one, I chose a street glide. I found that the weight of the fairing on the front tire was a little bit easier for me to wrap my head around and it moving with it versus the independent fairing. Now, years later, I really prefer the independent fairing on it. What I did is I had one of the boys take the bike out into the parking lot and I felt comfortable enough to ride it across the parking lot, stop, 
put it on the kickstand and then they would turn it around for me and I would ride it back. Now I did that a lot before I felt comfortable doing the U-turn. Then when I did the U-turn, I just did the little comfortably until I got the bike around. Over time, I perfected that and now I can keep both my feet up on the pegs and do a full circle and even a loop-de-loop -loop like this. So everything's gonna come with time and repetition. Just because you're a smaller female doesn't mean you can't ride a big bike like this just because it's heavy or intimidating. I'm one of the people to show you that it's definitely doable. I'm standing in, in, in front of an Iron 883 here because for the longest time, this has kind of been the gateway bike or the beginner bike in the Harley-Davidson world. They stopped making this bike in the 22 model year. Now they have the Nightster as, as their lowest priced tiered bike out on the floor which is lighter than this. These are both, relatively speaking, in the Harley-Davidson world, these are both good beginner bikes. Now, I usually tell people too, people say, well, what's a good beginner bike? I usually tell people a good beginner bike is the bike that you can drop and not care about it. This bike, for most people, if you drop it, you're gonna care about it. What I usually always recommend too to people is if you're a newer rider or you're, you're still uh, progressing your skills, get an engine guard. Get an engine guard and that's gonna save you from a lot of potential damage when you're experiencing just a simple tip over. When you're learning how to ride, everyone's gonna experience a simple tip over. So tips over, it's gonna hit the engine guard, you may scuff the back of your exhaust, you know, maybe your grip or something like that, minimal damage. So do that and progress your abilities after you take the rider course, get an inexpensive bike, um, or you know what, if you got money coming out of your eyeballs, you know, get the brand new Harley Davidson and you know, enjoy yourself because these are good bikes to you know, progress your skill on. It's just that these are works of art. A lot of times if you drop them, you're not gonna be, you're gonna be pissed off if you drop the bike. Like I mentioned, a good beginner bike is one that you can drop and not, not fret over it, not be sad about it. Okay, now there are definitely times where the bike starts to go and with my beautiful body injuries, I have learned over time, I just let it go. Now don't judge this bike because I don't currently have an engine guard on it, but on my Dyna, I have a Russ Weinermont um, engine guard on the front and that has saved me. When a bike started to go, I just let it go. It was coming down my driveway like this. I went to turn like that. It got the little whoop-de-whoop, -whoop, whoop, over it went. Now this is me getting ready for work, running a little bit late. And let me tell you, the amount of adrenaline inside of you, I was able to pick the bike up by myself. Do not recommend that. If there are men around you, definitely, hey, Hey, friends, anybody, ask them to help you because picking the bike up yourself, my back hurt for like two days. Now on this bike, most recently, I know in my last video, everybody told me to get a crash bar, which I had for my lowers, but didn't have on. I did drop this guy and I pulled up to my friend's house in Vegas a couple weeks ago and uh, I went over gravel and I went to put my right foot down and it just didn't touch the ground. So my bike went to the right and I just kept praying. I was like, please don't touch my fairing. And um, anywho, my friend comes outside and I'm underneath the bike like this and, and we got, we end up getting the bike up. But things happen, you know what I mean? I wouldn't let that discourage you from getting a big bike. Things are gonna happen. I would definitely encourage the engine guards on it. That way you don't have to repaint any pieces on your bike. Um, but yeah, things do happen. So don't be afraid of getting a big bike because of the weight of it. At the end of the day, I've dropped probably just about every bike that I have. The other thing that I'll mention too is a lot of times people want to buy a bike that they feel like fits them the most. That's important and that's definitely a criteria that I use personally when determining what bike that I want to ride. I'm six foot six, I'm on the taller side, and so I have a touring chassis bike because that is a bigger bike. But really, I would only put that maybe second or third on my buying criteria. If you guys want, I'm gonna link a video in the upper right hand corner here and that's gonna be my best things to ask yourself when you're thinking about buying a bike. But in that video, I talk about buy a bike that is the most conducive to the type of riding you're gonna be doing. So what I mean by that is, if you're gonna be doing putting around town, you like this style, uh, you're not gonna be doing a lot of long distance stuff, then a Sportster, uh, or maybe even in the soft tail world, that's gonna be a great bike for you. If you're someone like us, you know, Mickey, Andrew, Brandon, all these guys, that we go out on these long rides that you guys see on my channel, most of us have touring bikes, and that's for a reason. When you're out on the highway doing long distance stuff, you have a bigger fuel tank, they're more stable out on the highway, you're more comfortable out on the highway. And so that's gonna be the best bike for the type of riding we do. Touring bikes have more storage. Again, when you're packing stuff, you're going on a two, three day trip, you want as much storage as possible to carry clothing, camera gear, whatever you're packing around, right? If I didn't fit on a touring bike for whatever reason, I would do whatever I had to do to fit on a touring bike just because, like I said, 
My physical stature is less important to me than what the bike is built to do, if that makes sense to you guys. decided to get a Harley, I picked the Lowrider S. I really liked the sound of that 110 twin cam motor. I liked how club style that you could make it. And honestly, I'm pretty sure I was one of the only females in Southern California to have the bike fully done up the way that I had it done. And I liked that. I liked being able to run with the big boys in the canyon. I've taken that bike to the track. It was cool to me to be able to ride it, even though people were like, how do you ride that? It's so tall, it's such a big bike. For me, it was never about a bike being too big or a bike being more made for a man. I made my bike taller every single time and I just kind of adapted to how it worked. So I went from having this big motor Dyna heavy bike to a bagger. Because I would go state to state, I remember going to Oregon with Eric and being like, okay, we are shaking, you know, and having to get gas a little bit more often. So when I realized how much I love doing long distance travel, I decided that a bagger was just kind of the best way to do it. I love the hard lockable bags on it. I like the big frame on it. I love a Milwaukee 8 motor and asked me three years ago, I would have never said that, you know, and now I just love this motor. So there's a lot of different reasons why I chose this bike. At first I had an 06 Road King when my Dyna motor had gone bye bye and I love that bike. They had the older frame on it though. I had a 95 kit on it, T-bars. It just didn't feel as confident to me as a new Milwaukee 8 and the new frame, the suspension, everything that's gonna come on this bike. So I decided last year to splurge and I went and go ahead and got this uh, police road cake. So one of the first questions I always ask people when they come in is what type of riding do you do? And a lot of times people don't know how to answer that question because they don't really know what I'm asking them I think. And really what I'm asking them is, when you ride this motorcycle, where are you going? Are you going up into the canyons, twisties, you know, maybe burning 50 miles of gas or something like that? Or do you ride with people that go out of town and go on long rides? You know, a lot of that's gonna be dictated by your, your circle of friends that you ride with, you know, if you ride with the circle of friends. If you ride in the city, you never really venture too far out of the city. Something like a smaller, lightweight bike that doesn't really have a big fuel capacity and doesn't have luggage capacity might be a better bet for you. Maybe it's heavily congested traffic area. You know, all of those things you should definitely consider. You know, a soft tail, you know, talking about the, the Harley Davidson lineup, a soft tail is kind of one of those bikes that can go either direction. There's different models in the soft tail family, some with fairings, some with storage, like your Lowrider ST, your Heritage. Those bikes obviously lend a little bit more towards the, the touring world. But if you go like a street bob or something like that, then that's gonna lend itself a little bit more to like a stripped down bobber style around town, three and a half gallon tank that you're probably not gonna be venturing out of town too much on. That seat's a little hard, but it was good. <laughs> it was Danielle's fun. Driving. She does very good. Her riding is um, good. It was a little scary when she went between the cars, but it's okay. We survived. 
So a lot of people think that because a bike is big or because they're a female or because it's a small, they're small as a person, they can't ride a big bike. I just rode myself and Kelly on my Road King, which is a touring bike with a tour pack and a fairing. So almost like a limited or an ultra limited. So one of the largest bikes that they make. I've actually raised the suspension in the rear. So everything we just showed you in this video kind of goes 100% against every stereotype that you've ever heard that you can't ride a big bike uh, as a woman or with a passenger. So, hope you guys enjoyed that. You can do anything you want to do. <laughs> so to finish up guys, you don't have to be big, strong, burly dude to ride a Harley Davidson. If you take the proper steps and you learn the proper technique to how to handle a motorcycle properly, the weight of the bike is on the tires. Are you gonna get into situations sometimes where the weight tips over? Maybe you need to drop it down to the, the engine guard. Yeah, you know what? Everyone's dropped bikes. I've dropped motorcycles. It happens. You can't let that scare you. At the end of the day, with the right technique, the right braking, you're gonna be fine. I've seen, like I've said, a, a lot of people of all different sizes and shapes ride Harley Davidsons. You just wanna progress your skill in the right, safe manner, and don't buy a bike based on which one fits you solely. Again, that's important, but at the end of the day, the most important thing is buying the bike that fits your riding criteria and complements your riding habits the most. Does your size, height, and all that stuff play a part into what bike you buy? Definitely, but again, there's more important things to consider. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. I hope I helped you out. If I did, consider subscribing to the channel. We got a lot more Harley Davidson content coming your way. If I helped you out at all, like the video. If you're looking for Harley Davidson in Southern California, make sure you check us out here at Laidlaw's Harley Davidson, where we actually have no added dealer markup, none of the extra dealer fees that you see prep or any of that BS. We'll see you on the guys in the next one. Later.